Our next Inside Track speaker today hails from Longview, Washington. He is Frank McShane, founder of Square Peg Consulting and a supply chain cash guide. You know how many companies have trouble getting higher returns from their efforts because of supply chain, manufacturing, or people problems? What Frank does is guide companies using their own data to find cash in resilient supply chain approaches. The analysis and tools he helps put in place make it easier for companies to shift their focus to the most profitable customers and projects. He uses a whiteboard to clarify the key factors in his resilient approach. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Frank McShane at the whiteboard. Thank you, John. I appreciate that. I want to ask everybody to do uh, two things. If you go up to the upper right under your view uh, to go to the speaker view so that you can be able to see the whiteboard okay. And secondly, if you're on, uh, if you would please stay on mute, and if you have questions, put them in the chat area, or we'll get to them at or hold them, and we'll get to them at the end. So thank you. So yeah, we're going to talk today about primarily about the B2B supply chain. Of course, the term supply chain has been in the news quite a bit these days. So I've got four objectives for today. One is we get a common understanding of what is in the supply chain, what makes it up. Two, we understand some of the common problems that are out there and things that you could identify with your clients as well. Uh, three is to identify some things you can do, some high impact uh, activities that you can do with your clients to make a difference in their supply chain. And four, we'll hit on this current situation to see you know, what are, what's the perfect storm of events that's occurring right now that's, uh, that's clogging up the supply chain. So I've got on the board here kind of a big picture of the, of the B2B supply chain. And actually what we're going to see is there multiple supply chains included in the B2B supply chain. Uh, we begin at the end here with our customers. Okay, that's where the pull and the demand for products or services comes from. If we back up into the scope of your client, so these are not necessarily all internal to their company, but it's their responsibility. There's a, there's a number of planning activities that take place in the supply chain. Could be anything from strategic planning, forecasting, production planning, order management, transportation planning, purchasing planning, all of those activities take place across the whole internal supply chain. There's the buy activities. Again, these can take place either on the front end where we're buying services or raw materials or parts and product uh, to put into our product, or it could be at the far end where we're buying transportation services or warehouse services or distribution services, right? So buy cuts across the whole uh, supply chain. There's the make function, which is in manufacturing, it's the actual producing of products. In services, it's really the preparation to deliver a service. So it could be in engineering where we're designing something that we're gonna deliver. Or uh, I worked for an internet service business that was getting the trucks loaded and, and ready to go out and install. Uh, that would fall under the make uh, process. And then there's the move process, which is from the end of production or the end of preparation all the way to the customer. Supporting all of that activity are the people and the teams that the client has in place. Right, so we'll get to those in a little while. At the front end is the suppliers. So our products, raw material services are coming into the internal supply chain uh, from those guys. There's two, as I said, there's multiple supply chain. At the front end, it's called the inbound supply chain, which is from the suppliers all the way up to the beginning of May. And from there on, it's called the outbound supply chain, which is from the beginning of May all the way to the customer. The picture is still incomplete though. We, we need to understand 
the customer's customer. We're going to understand our supply chain and how to make it work better. We need to understand our customers' customers because that's what's triggering their demand back into our our business. And on this side, we really need to understand the supplier's supplier and what's going on with them. And this is where a lot of the current issues are taking place right now, where the supplier supplier shut down because of COVID. And that affected this supplier who immediately provides us with products or services. So that's the that's kind of the full scope of the supply chain is, as you can see, it's, it's pretty broad. If we start at the customer end, there's one thing, one problem that, that I run into a good bit with my clients, and that is they're not happy with the return they're getting from their customer. Volume is going up, they're expanding their business, but profit is not following at the same rate, right? And so one thing you can do pretty straightforwardly is we're going to do an analysis of the impact of the various customers on the business. And there's two ways of looking at that. First is the impact and then the number of customers that have various levels of impact. And by impact, some people will use sales as the measure for that. Some will use gross profit, which is a little better. It's closer to the really bottom line impact of the business. The one I would prefer and recommend you look at is what's called cash contribution. So that's essentially gross profit minus the cost of serving each of those customers. And it tells us what's the cash left over at the end of the transaction with those customers. And what we're looking for here is who generates 80% of the impact of, on, on the business? Who generates the next 15% of the impact to the business? And lastly, who generates the last 5% of impact? Unfortunately, sometimes we find there's people that are down here generating negative impact on the business. That, even though we have a gross profit, by the time we serve the customers, get the product or the services to them and get completed, we've lost money. So we want to look at that impact in a descending fashion and draw lines where we get to 80%, 15%, and 5 The typical breakdown is 20% will generate 80% of the impact. No surprise, since Pareto was alive, that's been the case. You'll probably find somewhere around 30% to generate the next 15% of impact. And you'll, you may find up to 50% of the customers only generate 5% of the cash impact to the business. So that's typical. It doesn't, that's, doesn't mean it's good. It means it's typical. I have two clients, a, distribute, a large distribution company and a large food processor. And they have 9% of their customers that generate 80%. And 70% of their customers only generate 5% of the cash impact to the business, positive cash impact to the business. And so the problem with this is, as you can probably tell, we're going to end up spending way too much time and effort serving these customers and not nearly enough time and effort serving these guys up here. And our salespeople uh, sometimes are uh, not on purpose, but at fault where they're out hunting for volume and getting paid on volume or getting paid on gross profit only and not cash contribution. And so they go out and find the easy customers to get smaller customers or customers we've carried on for years and not hunting for these larger ones. And the reason this is so important is this relationship right here these top group is, has 16 times the impact to the business that that bottom group does. So if you divide 80 by five, you get 16. 
So we should be paying 16 times more attention to these, this top group than we are here. We should design our supply chain to satisfy these customers and, and work with these at the lowest possible cost we can. It's, if you think of airlines, you know, these are the first class passengers. These might be the business class passengers in the middle, and that bottom group are the basic economy guys in the back. But unfortunately, when you analyze this, we find that every, we, oftentimes we treat them all the same. And that's just like giving the first class food to the person in the last row in the back. Right, so we, we want to avoid that. We want to make sure we've, we've aimed our supply chain at these guys and our, our salespeople hunting for more of these people. So that's an analysis you can do, and it, you can add tremendous value to your clients about getting them aimed at, the, at these customers and more like them. If we come back into this, the supply chain in the move area, there's a lot to talk about in there, which we don't have time for today. Inventory, transportation, distribution, warehousing, et cetera. But there's one, one uh, issue that I want to show you, and that's around shipping capacity. So, and particularly these days, with the shortage of trucks and shortage of shipping uh, providers out there, they're looking for who can get me in and out of the shipping dock the fastest, right? Because the faster I can turn the shipment around, the more I can use my, my assets and I can do more business. And so you can do a pretty quick analysis just going out to their shipping dock and looking at the time from the time this truck shows up until the truck leaves and observe what's going on in that time frame. And when you're going to be looking for two things, what are the things that could be done prior to the ship truck showing up? That's the call external activities. And what are the things that can only be done when the truck is at the dock? Those are called internal activities. And what you'll find is there's a lot of external activities that are taking place after the truck shows up at the dock. There's inspection, there's staging, there's cleaning of the product. All of these things that could have been done well in advance of the truck showing up are happening once it gets at the dock. And it's not unusual. You could, you could actually cut this time. If you remove these external activities and did them in advance, you could cut this time in half. And what you've done is doubled the capacity, the shipping capacity of your client. Huge benefit. And if they go out and find more of these larger impact customers, now we can absorb that volume at no extra cost or, or less extra cost. So that's another kind of a straightforward one. In the world of manufacturing, you know, lots of things can, can be done in there, but there's two I wanted to bring to your attention. The first one is called tact time. So there's a lot of confusion about that term if you're familiar with it. Some people think it's how fast you can make something. Actually, what it is, the, the literal interpretation of that is how fast do you need to make something in order to meet your market demand. <clears throat> I have a client, a medical device company. They were kind of a mom and pop producing about 1,000 units a month. They're in the, in the diabetes testing world. They got discovered by a distributor who, served, who provides product to big box stores. And all of a sudden their order started to climb and they had to get to 10,000 a month. So we needed to know how often do we need to make one of these devices to meet 10,000 a month. Well, conveniently, if you look at one shift for a month, at eight hours a day for a month, there's 10,000 minutes in a one shift operation and we needed to make 10,000 units. So we had to have one pop out every minute, right? And so that, that's important to know for your client to know, I've got to produce things, everything one, one a minute in this particular example. That means everything that happens leading up to that last step can't take more than a minute. Otherwise it becomes a bottleneck, right? So you can go back and, res and reshape the production process within that tack time 
whatever the attack time ends up being, the, the time which you have to make something, everything has to fit within that mode. All of a sudden, output will start to improve. The other piece you can do is look at, are they doing things in a batch mode? Or are they using what's called one piece flow? All right. One piece flow. So if you think about it, a lot of manufacturing focus has been around efficiency. And that's been that's driven this drive to produce batches because for manufacturing, they can make a lot of things and they get credit for that, right? But they make them in big batches, let's say a hundred at a time. Then they make the then they go to the next step and they do the next hundred, and then the next step and the next hundred. But that first one is waiting for the rest of the 99 to get done before it moves to the next step. And then it has to wait again for the next 99 to get done. And so the, the cycle time begins to increase dramatically working with batches, and it limits the amount of throughput you can get from a, a manufacturing facility. So if you can cut the batches, hopefully down to one, where you do one, you do the step on the first one, move it immediately to the next one, do that step, move it to the next one. Back at the beginning, you're doing them one at a time and moving them. You'll find that the throughput goes way up. So we did that with the group that had to go from 1,000 to 10,000. We had all the steps take under a minute, and we did it with one piece flow. And they were able to go from 1,000 to 10,000 and only added two people to their assembly operation to get that done. And it was really switching from batch to one piece flow. Uh, if we back up now into buy, which is kind of the area of controversy these days, there's another analysis you can do fairly quickly with your client, and that is looking at how much are they spending with each supplier and how much choice do they really have for that item. And of course, we end up with the classic consulting two by two metrics. But what you'll find is that if you have if you have suppliers where you're spending a lot of money with them and you don't have a lot of choice, so that's that's really a strategic partner. And the approach you've got to take with them is they need to know all this information back to what the customer customer is going to do in order to prepare to make sure you have what you need on time. And you can focus more of your attention on these guys. You can also find mutual, mutually beneficial arrangements around lead time, inventory, quality, delivery processes. And you don't even have to talk about price. You can reduce your mutual costs together. If you have a lot of dollars and a lot of choices, you got to make sure that the client is making those competitive. You know, they should be putting those out to bid on a, at least an annual basis. A lot of money at stake. There's a lot of choices out there. The problem I, I run into is that getting the client to open up their eyes about what choices they really have. They're comfortable with some suppliers. They may be local suppliers that they want to support, but they really have more choices than that, and they're not exploring them. doesn't mean they have to change suppliers, but they ought to make it more competitive. The same thing goes on with these low dollar items where you actually have choices like office supplies and, and you know, janitorial services and things like that that are fairly common. And each one by itself is not that much money. And what happens is the client gets kind of fat, dumb, and happy about and doesn't pay any attention to these, this area of the spend over here. And it just keeps going to the same people year in, year out. And they pass on a price increase and and they just keep doing the business because everybody's focused on these larger dollar items up here. But if you add all this together, you find out there's actually a lot of money here. And so this one is another area. We've got to make it more competitive in order to really drop down the total cost of doing business, not necessarily the price of the items, but the total cost of doing business. We want to make that as little as possible here. And then this last one, if we've got small dollars but not many choices, 
those are suppliers you want to minimize the use of those suppliers as much as possible including potentially insourcing whatever they're doing let's say it's a maintenance service of some sort down here there's only one person in anywhere in in their vicinity that does that work and they're charging you whatever they want to charge you you may be better off developing that skill internal so that's another thing you can do you don't have to be a supply chain expert to do these analyses here the last section is this around people and teams and so for that one it's really thinking about the roles that we want people to play this is what i find a lot of clients don't do that we could help them with is to think through what are the real requirements of the role you're going to ask somebody to perform too often what we find and particularly in supply chain and manufacturing is the leadership has been promoted from being the best operators <clears throat> or the best drivers or the best forklift operators become the supervisor and that's the reason why they get promoted not because they're a good communicator and they can uh, effectively manage people and deal with issues and, and stress and all that kind of stuff. It's because of what they used to do. And that's a, that's a mistake. And so what you end up getting is you end up getting people in leadership roles who really aren't suited for that role. So the first thing is help them think through the roles. And the second thing is to help them think through what are the objectives that the team is trying to accomplish in this case it's really an execution strategy in, in the supply chain team that's mostly what what's being done so you need people who are, are have a sense of urgency they're proactive they're careful and thorough about what they're going to do and they have a sense of urgency they're pro they're thinking ahead anticipating what's coming for them um, and and they're also collaborative so that's another piece of the, the role and the objectives is they got to collaborate together. This, this can't succeed if this doesn't succeed. Otherwise, we're just going to pump a bunch of product into an inventory and it sits in a warehouse somewhere. So we've got to think about what are the objectives and do the teams, do the personalities of the teams, as you put them together, do they match up to those objectives? And there are tools available to help do that. I, I work with one called the Predictive Index one of many that are out there, but it's, it's designed to help assess roles, assess individuals, and assess teams. So you can figure out, am I matching my team and my people to what the work that really needs to get done? So that's kind of the overview for today. So if you think about it, we've, we've identified where we can make a 16 times impact by switching our focus to these types of customers instead of those. We potentially cut the shipping time in half and increase shipping capacity by 100%. We can increase uh, throughput dramatically, uh, not always 10 to 1 like we did in the medical device, but you can increase uh, throughput dramatically by understanding how fast do I have to make something to meet my market demand and trying to do it one piece at a time instead of a bunch of batches. Do that. And we've identified strategies to use with our suppliers so that we minimize total cost, and our, particularly our mutual total cost, because they're basing their prices on their total cost that you cause them uh, to provide their product or their services. So we know how to minimize that. That keeps you away from that necessarily having to negotiate price. Uh, other than in these very competitive areas, but particularly with your strategic suppliers, you want to look at ways to reduce the uh, mutual cost. And then make sure to sustain any of those improvements. We've got to have the right people in the right roles, and the teams have to be, the nature of the teams have to match the objectives that we're trying to accomplish here. Recently, you know, a perfect storm of things that have occurred in the supply chain demand spiked as shutdowns stopped and lockdowns opened up etc around the world demand spiked people have been holding off buying and staying home and all those kind of things all of a sudden demand went way up meanwhile these areas were impacted by covid 
where we're strapped labor-wise, in the particularly in the make and the move areas, and trucking is a shortage, even uh, manufacturing labor was a shortage, and that cascaded all the way back into the supplier uh, levels too, where they were suffering from COVID restrictions, particularly overseas. So that became a big problem because they're much more strict in their lockdowns than we are. And so all of those factories in China, for example, were, were shut down to prevent the spread of the, of the virus. And so all of a sudden there was this big gap in those suppliers providing materials, chips, et cetera, uh, to our, our business. Here we're suffering mostly from, a, in, in the domestic picture, we're suffering from a shortage of drivers transportation capacity. With some restriction in manufacturing capacity too, just from individual plants, meat packing, et cetera, that got hit hard. But the but we can produce stuff, it's just getting it from there to the customer is the is the big challenge. So I hope that helps. Uh, give you a little bit of things you can do with your clients. You don't have to bill yourself as a supply chain expert to do some of this. And uh, it's a lot of fun and you can have a big impact. So with that, John, I'm open to, to questions. Do we have any in the chat room? Yes. So there's a couple, of, there's a question here. I thought it's a pretty interesting one. Is it, is it better to record materials when they're shipped or when they are received? And what are the challenges of each of those options? So I would take us back to our supplier analysis. If it's a strategic supplier, I would say you ought to take ownership of it as quickly as possible. Right, so, and that may be part of the negotiation of that relationship is when does the ownership transfer and the responsibility transfer. For those where you have more leverage, where you can be competitive with them, I would keep the ownership with them as long as possible and off your books uh, as long as possible. But again, if you have leverage, you may want to uh, negotiate a, an inventory that they keep for you this is what Toyota did to outlast all of the other auto suppliers this year from running out of chips. They, they experienced this thing when they had the earthquake in Fukushima, and they lost a bunch of suppliers at that point in time, and they realized that just in time wasn't going to be the answer for them anymore, and that they needed to make sure that those suppliers held an inventory for them. But Toyota is the big enough gorilla where they could say, you're going to hold the, we're going to commit to the inventory, but you're going to hold it <laughs> until we need it, right? But when we need it, we want it. Bottom right corner there, I was going to ask you if there's ever a case for a lost leader. You've got activity and expenses going in for the, you know, the bottom tier, not quite so good uh, customers. Uh, you don't want to spend too much resources on those. When, when, when do you cut that off? I mean, is it worth it to have a lost sure. leader? Do you get any business from that? Yeah, I, I think it is. I mean, it, just because you get them in these categories, you don't want to make any all one way or the other decisions, right? You still need to look at each one individually. There may be a new cu new customer who's in that bottom group, but they're going to grow, right? So there's a possibility okay. to, to get more out of them. They may be related to one of the 80% yet. We have you know, in, my, yeah. in my distribution company, we got a bunch of those where they they're actually related. We go, no, we don't we we don't want to you know shortcut those guys because they'll piss okay. off the, the guy at the top, right? Sure. Okay. So there's so there's still individual judgments, but at least it gets you to start thinking about them differently, right? Because the mm -hmm. you think about them in the first class, business class, economy class kind of mentality, right? So what can we do to really uh, wow the customers at the top with service? What can we do to get the last guys on time safely to their destination? But that's about it. <laughs> that's all they get, yeah, right? So, yeah. yeah. But I think that's probably one of the best explanations that I've heard anywhere for a long time on the supply chain. I've been working at it myself for 50 years. And, um, and the one thing I can testify to is that 99% of the people who talk about supply chains haven't got a clue. And thank you very much, Frank, because I think you've opened a lot of people's eyes as to what's involved. Good. Yeah. Thank you. Appreciate it, John, very much. Glad to know you've been in supply chain. Yeah, you know, it's a good get your fingers dirty kind of a work, right? It's fun. I, it's fun work. I, I joke about it. I think I was born in a warehouse. 